My name's Sean Conley. Uh, been at VMware just about a year now um, as part of the Spring Source acquisition uh, that was announced at last year's VMworld. Um, so, uh, like I said, thanks for attending today. Um, so, my area of responsibility or sort of background, um, even prior to coming to Spring Source, which was at Spring Source just about a year before the VMware acquisition. I'm a longtime sort of VMware user in the past, um, virtualizing dev and test scenarios and exercising the early days lab manager stuff, which I found really cool. Um, I kind of liken that as sort of the cloud 1.0 technology, um, if you will. Um, and then since then, I was at uh, JBoss uh, and Red Hat and, and then joined Spring Source and Rod Johnson and the gang um, for all the cool stuff they were doing at this Java layer. Um, so uh, sort of before we get started, the legal ease, you can sort of bore yourself with that. I'll touch on directionally with some of the things that we're doing. I won't sort of cover, you know, you know, I'll be covering things that are probably you know, within the next six months that are landing and that kind of stuff. So a lot of what I cover is actually available and, and in use today. So, but I, you know, there are forward-looking statements, blah, blah, blah. So um, from a roadmap presentation standpoint, I'm just going to set some brief context, reiterate what was covered on how, you know, how we look at this IT as a service landscape. Not going to spend a lot of time on that, but just set the context. Um, then I'm going to spend a little time on uh, cloud application platform and drivers that we see generally in this area. So you get a better idea of what problems we're actually trying to solve. Because a lot of the names of these technologies and what they do are kind of similar to the past. But um, I'm not really looking to commoditize existing architectures. We're really trying to drive some new architectural direction. And I just want to shed some light on the kinds of things that we're doing there so you get a better picture of why what we've assembled to date, and as we add new things, why it makes sense. Um, and then uh, I will spend uh, some time on the uh, VMware vFabric uh, cloud application platform, the pieces of that, um, and what kind of applications they uh, sort of fit into, if you will. So that's sort of you know, the th three areas. We'll sp spend the most of the time on the blue and the green um, with some of the initial context. So as, as was mentioned, um, in the keynote earlier, there's basically a whole series of applications and architectures are, are, are changing. Um, and so VMware infrastructure is sort of well positioned to power a lot of that. Um, and then also hit the devices. I was ragging on a couple of the gentlemen in the back who are playing with their iPads and iPhones, right? They're making Steve Herod mad, right? Because it's, <laughs> you know, they're using their new toys. But that's reality is you look and it's just getting very pervasive in, in new ways of accessing information. Um, and then existing data, data centers and public infrastructure and really wrapping a bow, if you will, around you know, trying to address the concerns up and down from the user experience, the application platforms that they ride on and the infrastructure that ultimately uh, uh, rides on top of. Um, and when I, uh, you know, you know, when I sort of look at, you know, when we look at this from a sort of a three-layer area, you know, you have the, the traditional VMware infrastructure platform, uh, the cloud application platform, which we'll spend our time on. And I'll also touch on a little bit on our partnerships with, our technology partnership with Google, just shed a little light on why we chose that, as well as our partnership, uh, strategic partnership with Salesforce around the VM4 stuff. We'll won't spend a lot of time, but I'll set some context on why we're doing what we're doing there and how we're funneling that back into the technology we're creating because it's actually important in the strategy. Um, so we'll drill into the, to the, uh, the middle layer. Um, so sort of taking a step back, it's sort of easy to say, well, you, here's this new architecture layer for new applications. But really, before we sort of uh, get into what that means, it's really important to sort of map this back into what end users care about and what IT teams actually have to deal with in delivering. Um, so, um, you know, easy to use applications that are very data rich, that can be accessed anywhere, anytime, and, and, and actually has the social elements and some of these consumer oriented services that are a part of this, right? That whole experience as it relates to enterprise applications is just on the increase. Um, and then easy to develop, fast to deploy, instantly scalable and portable, how do you deliver more, more quickly? Both, and how do you address the needs of not only developers, which is where Spring and Spring Framework and the Spring Source technologies originally started, but how do you actually enable the IT 
ops folks who have to actually keep the lights on and deploy this stuff, how do you give them the tooling they need? So um, the new application world, when I, I use some examples just to sort of give you an idea of when we say what this new world looks like, we'll sort of map this into, uh, you know, so what does that really mean? So if we look at Twitter as an example, right? So lots of people are using Twitter today. Um, a lot, you know, hundreds of millions of, you know, tweets posted on this, on this, uh, on this site. And when you look at that traffic, 75% of the traffic that's driven to that site is not posts from people, it's posts from other applications, right? So applications in and of themselves are communicating much more dynamically and much more fluidly, right? So that's, that's an architectural concern for the next generation of applications because applications can kind of be anywhere and they need to communicate, interact, and integrate. So that's number one. Um, number two, when you look at architectures like even prior to joining SpringSource, I was in a social media failed startup. We won't go over that. I'm still bitter about that. But uh, in the social media space and, and the Facebook area, and when you look at their architecture and how they scale to meet you know, the... 500 million users posting, you know, uh, you know, logging, at, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of hours of day each, you know, each day on, on this site. Um, in order to scale, they're using new data architectures, data caching architectures, and, you know, uh, globally distributing, you know, data to where it needs to be closer to the uh, end user, right? And so that's a different thing than sort of typical, let me cluster a traditional J2E application server, right? That's, that's not really something that's going to scale out to meet those needs, right? So applications need to communicate. You need high-scale data access to the next generation of applications. So these are just examples of some of the architectural concerns of sort of these new apps that we're trying to factor in when we actually pull together a platform. Um, the other interesting thing, it was even in uh, Paul's keynote, was the number of apps deployed on virtual servers versus physical servers is, you know, it's that inflection point has been met. So it's increasingly a virtual environment, right? So having, an, you know, an optimized experience on that is key. So um, I like to pick on Steve um, as the business owner. I'm going to walk you through some use cases of what's driving what we've actually put into this platform, right? So, uh, and this hotel room booking example is going to be throughout sort of the uh, thing as we begin to sort of peel the onion, if you will. So he, he needs a new app to manage hotel room bookings, right? So comes up with that, and it, of course it needs to be engaging and address the user concerns that we just talked about, and sends that off to the developers. And like I pointed out is this new wave of apps, you're, you need to sort of integrate with applications inside your four walls, but increasingly software as a service applications, what have you, and social media uh, type uh, you know, services that you want to, for instance, factor in Twitter and Facebook stuff in there, but have the right authorization and, and have a consistent security model on how things are accessed and those types of things. And then, of course, you have to uh, access, at the end of the day, it's about applications, data, and the infrastructure it runs on. So data access and supporting sort of access to existing systems, but increasingly, there's new ways of storing data, like uh, you know, the Twitter example is tweets aren't stored in a uh, relational database. They use a relational database for their user access stuff, but not for sort of the high volume data that's flowing through that system. So there's new types of uh, data stores, if you will, that need to be factored into this new wave, if you will, um, as well as batch processing and, and traditional integration patterns. Uh, on any device, as we mentioned, and oh, by the way, you know, once you've got this really cool application, you know, make it high-performing, highly available, secure, et cetera, right? So these are all the concerns typically that are pushed into the developers and architects for them to figure out what tools and technologies, et cetera, they're going to use to actually create this sort of next generation of apps. Um, and then uh, you, uh, you typically extend that group to include the, op, the app operations folks who actually have to run this. So now I need a platform to run this and scale this, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the areas, particularly when I joined SpringSource, um, there's sort of this uh, rising wave of this DevOps movement, which is a smerging of developer and operations and administrators who participate in that. 
that's an ongoing wave, but the whole goal of that is to get up a joined up experience between developers creating apps and getting them deployed very quickly and making sure they can scale, right? So this is a convergence, if you will, of roles that'll happen over the next X number of years, right? Much like VMware traditionally is driving the convergence of servers, storage, network, and security and things like that into a, you know, into a more of a consistent role. Um, at this app player, uh, operations is, it, you know, it isn't, they're not needed, they are needed, right? You need to have a controlled environment to deploy. So let's proactively include them and give them the tools they need, right? As opposed to saying they're just getting in my way. That's not, that's a non-answer. So when we look at, and when we invested in, in particular in our platform, we look at lightweight runtime environments that can be provisioned very quickly and scale very quickly. And I'll give you an example of how, you know, some users, when, when I say elastic application server, um, it's, uh, you know, in order to hit scale points, rolling out 2,000 new servers for major new load might take a better part of a week, you know, new application servers, whereas lighter weight alternatives, you can actually, actually spin them up in hours, right, to meet the demand. That's what I mean by lighter weight, you know, el you know elastic, easy to provision um, type of experience, number one. Number two is you're moving off of physical infrastructure to virtual infrastructure, being able to spin up three, four instances inside a VM, and we have customers doing that as well, so you can actually drive more throughput through your application using existing memory, CPU, right, and you get all the benefits in the underlying platform. So that whole lightweight experience as it relates to powering the apps, but also having notions around global data management, so that caching, that getting the data out to the edges where it needs to be is what we mean by global data management, but doing it in, in a way that it's controlled, and you know what data is going to be moved where, who can access it, right? So that way when you have sort of, uh, uh, you know, concerns on, um, you know, global concerns on what data is available, you know, across geographies, you're actually can able, uh, you can control what data goes where. And then that cloud mass messaging is, uh, I kind of liken it to the twittering between applications, right? So you need applications having a high-speed way of communicating. And so rather than putting huge volumes of data into message payloads and moving them around, you put them in a global data management fabric, if you will, and you have messages kind of like Twitter, where you tweet and say, here's a tiny URL to the payload. Cloud messaging is about tweeting and giving you a, uh, a URL, if you will, to the data that's in the data management layer. So high-speed access that's globally scalable. So these are some of the notions that we feel are important of a platform, if you will. Um, but that, that's cool for sort of developers to get high scalability and operators to scale the application. But you also need the manageability element of it and, and the automation and that type of stuff. And so being able to dynamically load balance and spin up and spin down on, you know, with capacity um, and baking in performance management, not only transactional visibility, but just how, how many hotel rooms am I booking at a time? Let me apply an SLA around that. You know, if you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So that's been the, you know, the strategy we've been executing on for two years is, no, you need to measure it so you can manage it, right, at the application layer. And then dovetail that with your infrastructure so you can actually drive real intelligent behavior that's policy driven, right? So these are the notions of a platform that we feel are, are important. Is that necessarily a complete set? Maybe not necessarily, right? There's security and other things. And you, you heard some of the other announcements that were uh, you know, brought up in the keynote around the integrity and solution for this sort of dynamic analytics that integrates with our performance management today. Right, so you can get a lot of that stuff today. And then the security stuff for single sign-on, that's something that's important uh, over the long haul as well. But anyhow, these are some of the important behaviors, if you will. So at the end of the day, the new application world is all about, you know, it's web-oriented. It isn't about web applications, right? So definition of terms here, it's using the internet, right, to communicate. So it's web-oriented. It can be like the Twitter example I gave you is, applications talking to other applications. There's not a human involved with a browser, but it is web-oriented behavior, right? 
um, interactive, data rich. So everybody wants access to the data and they want access to it now, <laughs> right? Um, and that's, you just have to factor that in. And then um, uh, powered by on-demand app platform services and, and virtual infrastructure, which we'll get into. But sort of this is the summary of the world is, here's the type of applications, here's the type of infrastructure experience uh, that's required, if you will. So that's setting the context for some of the stuff that Steve Howard covered in his keynote is the, the layers that we see are important in this new world are modern frameworks and tools that enable developers to be highly productive in creating these new applications. And we'll get into a little bit of what we have and other things that we're adding, particularly as part of our Google partnership and, and the VM force work that we're doing and directionally where, where this needs to go. Um, and then also modern platform services. The key here is, and this is, again, this is fundamental in our DNA when we're pulling together a stack here, is those notions, those concerns, need to be cleanly separated, right? So tying the programming model to the platform is a mistake architecturally, in our opinion, right? From, because then what you do is you tie innovation of getting some of these new notions of getting social media and these other concerns into how fast a platform can evolve, right? And that's, in the enterprise Java space, that's Rod Johnson's sort of view over the past few years is that's fundamentally why, you know, the appeal to developers has sort of diminished a little bit over time because the programming model can't evolve fast enough because it's tied to the, the platform itself. It's tightly coupled. So decoupling those is important, number one. Number two, portability if you decouple them, then you set yourself up to actually have portability as a concern. So I'll, I'll spend time on our vFabric platform services, and I'd love that everybody would use it. At the end of the day, um, our brand promise for our framework and tools is productivity and portability, right? So if we don't enable you to be portable across Java platforms as well as cloud platforms on the, how developers create applications, then we're wrecking fundamentally a brand promise that we've built up over the past five, six years, um, and that, that would not be good. So, and then the platform services are about the runtime environment. So um, there's the spring layer, and then there's the VM, uh, VMware vFabric uh, platform services that comprise this vFabric cloud application platform, if you will. Um, one of the things Steve um, brought up in his uh, keynote, um, and I'll, I'll cover it in a little more depth, we are looking at other frameworks and uh, you know, appeal to other developer environments, and I'll describe how, that, how they participate in the platform services. Um, so we, we do have a strong Java bent right now, primarily because that's a very rich market, particularly in the enterprise area, but we also have technologies that serve other areas, and I'll, I'll touch on that. So um, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with sort of this spring notion or what have you, I'll give you an idea you know, a little bit more about w what it means and, and what type of applications it's used for. So um, the, the Spring framework and related tools enable developers to create Java-based applications. And typically it's been more middle-tier web, web app type applications. Um, but over the past few years, that portfolio of technology, if you will, or framework technology has expanded out to implement um, the enterprise integration patterns that are very popular and been written up. And there's, you know, so you have notions of a um, uh, claim check pattern. I use that as an example, integration pattern, where you can have a message flowing around with that pointer to the data, right? And, and then, you know, so it'd be high-speed messaging. I have my pointer to the data, my unique identifier, and then I can look it up in the data fabric, right? So that way you don't have to move data around for integration. You can actually operate on it in a high-speed sort of distributed data tier, if you will. Um, that's just one example of an integration pattern. Um, and then there's batch processing. So we, we're seeing customers using the spring batch technologies to begin to modernize their traditional mainframe batch apps and begin to move them over to a, more of a modern platform. Just an example. We, uh, Accenture and our engineers um, brought that technology out about a year and a half ago, and it's been improved um, since then over, over the past uh, a uh, year and a half or so. Um, and then where areas that we're uh, investing in, in particular, as we've extended the uh, platform, 
uh, is around data access. So traditional SQL access is very, you know, is very common, but we're extending the consistent programming model. So these, this notion of NoSQL data stores and sort of name value pair storage type uh, notions can be proactively factored into the programming model. So at the end of the day, developers have a very consistent way of creating applications that span that whole gamut, if you will, right? And that's important because you, know, you need to be, be, bring them forward, but you don't want to introduce new notions of, oh, you want to do integration? Well, here's a whole completely different type of APIs that you need to use. You want to provide a very fundamentally consistent programming model, right? And so that's, that's really the charter of that spring layer. All open source, free developer tooling, on-ramp, consistent Eclipse-based developer experience um, uh, you know, that enables them to create these applications in a portable way. Um, and then the vFabric platform is really aimed at addressing those other notions on the runtime platform that I mentioned earlier around you know, you know, powering those applications, having data tier and messaging that's um, suited to the, to, to the new needs. And, and the sort of the product names, if you will, that sort of fit into that category are, are Apache Tomcat-based TC server, um, which is a lightweight application platform. Um, the Gemfire product, which came as part of our acquisition of Gemstone um, three or four months ago. Um, and I'll get into a specific use case example of how this Gemfire technology is used so we would put, put more of a picture on it. Um, but definitely very mission critical. It's powering risk processing applications on Wall Street today um, in a very high scale round the, you know, round the clock trading patterns from Tokyo to the New York Stock Exchange or what have you. It moves data where it needs to be very quickly. Um, so rock solid um, proven technology there. And then the Rabbit MQ is sort of the, is sort of that Twitter for between applications. It's that messaging layer, if you will, right? And we, we added that right around when we acquired the Gemstone uh, technology. Um, the basis of the Rabbit MQ technology it implements this protocol called AMQP. Um, JPMC and Wall Street developed this protocol as a high-speed messaging protocol and put it out in open source. And Rabbit's one of those implementations that implements it, right? So it has its DNA in high-performance messaging. Um, it's not an MQ series replacement. It's for next-generation messaging, right? Um, and, uh, and then we have our Apache web server, our Hyperic technology, which I believe Steve mentioned earlier. That gets to the performance visibility. Um, and we recently had a release of Hyperic 4.4, which um, tightened up the integration with vCenter server. So now you actually can drill in to, from your hosts, see what virtual machines are running on those hosts, drill down into their virtual machines to see what software is running in those hosts and how that software is actually performing inside the guests, right? So you get this you know, dovetailing of infrastructure on up through the application, and it gives you visibility up through this spring layer. So as you're creating your web apps, that hotel room booking application, how many hotel rooms am I booking per second? It gives you visibility at that layer, right? So now you can actually have real interesting scenarios on, I need to scale to meet my traffic you know, needs. Let me negotiate with vSphere and vCenter to actually do that intelligently, right? So it's sort of a non-trivial, you know, set, are we done yet? No, but we've come a really long way on integrating these technologies, which is really, really excellent. Um, and then we have this code name uh, NAPA uh, pro uh, project, and I believe we're showing some of the uh, stuff in our demo pods. Um, so much like Project Redwood was the code name for ultimately what was, you know, uh, cl uh, VMware Cloud Service Director, vCloud Service Director, vCloud Director, or whatever it wound up being, right? Um, we have Project NAPA, which is all about automating the provisioning and configuration of the application and the platform services that are required uh, for that. Um, so uh, it builds on top of the notions of Redwood um, and in introduces a new notion around uh, a deployment blueprint, if you will. Um, and what I mean by that is 
It's multiple virtual machines that are treated as part of a V app, a virtual app. And being able to set policy around boot order, how you want the app server portion of this V app to scale so you can add VMs dynamically. So it's sort of a dynamic V app notion for this application layer. And again, our engineering teams on the vSphere, uh, as well as the management, as well as our spring source engineers are all collaborating on, on this uh, sort of next generation provisioning uh, technology. Um, so at the end of the day, when we view what we're really trying to do is we look at the Java market or the, you know, the Java community, if you will, and you know, one could argue, and I've been a Microsoft developer in the past as well as sort of been in the Java market for a while, and when you look at sort of Microsoft, they actually, with Azure and others, there's sort of a path to cloud, if you will, for the Microsoft ecosystem. But in the Java ecosystem, there really isn't a clear path to cloud. Um, and that was one of the things um, a couple years ago when I joined Spring Source was fundamentally this was what Rod Johnson want, wanted to provide. He felt it was his duty having pro, you know, provided this very easy, approachable Spring programming model to actually begin to leverage that as the path to cloud for the Java uh, community. Um, and that's, that provides context around why we establish these relationships with Google and the, uh, Salesforce. And the reason is, it's one thing to say you want to provide a path to cloud, right? It's another thing to actually pair up with some of the real cloud providers from an enterprise standpoint with Salesforce and from a consumer-oriented standpoint with Google and begin to uh, extend that programming model so you can get these next-generation cloud notions factored in as first-class citizens into the programming model. Um, so that's really when we, at the end of the day, that was why we established those relationships, was to make sure that as we build out this experience, that it's done in a way that is actually usable and, and, and rooted in reality, as opposed to us just figuring out sort of inside our four walls, if you will. Um, the Google partnership is really more of a technology partnership, run Spring applications on Google App Engine, integrate with their Google Web Toolkit technology, for targeting the iPads, the iPhones, and the Android devices that you're carrying around so you can have apps that target those. Um, and then also they have this performance uh, uh, monitoring solution called Google Speed Tracer, um, which gives you performance of your application within the browser. It's a Chrome uh, plugin um, around how the JavaScript is performing. But when it makes requests to a server, um, it's sort of a black box. This is how it took me five seconds for that thing to give me back my data. But what we've done is we've joined up the visibility in our Spring stack. So in Google Speed Tracer, you actually go into our app server and see the hotel room booking uh, and all the way down into the database query that, and queries that were executed as part of that transactional trace. And it's a really excellent, cool sort of experience. We have a video that shows this integration uh, sort of in play on our website. But that's the Google one, and then the uh, VM Force one is really providing an enterprise Java platform for really the enterprise salesforce.com ecosystem, if, if you will, um, and powered by the force.com multi-tenant database um, it, sort of in the cloud. So when we look at the experience that we want to enact, we have a set of tools and frameworks where developers can consistently build their applications and deploy them anywhere. And that is uh, our Spring Tool Suite is available today, and developers build applications today and drag them and drop them onto Amazon or other cloud platforms today, right? So that, that technology is in place, um, and we've been building that up for the past couple of years. And that will extend to include the VM Force and improve the Google App Engine deployment stuff that we talked about. Um, and then from a, the, v, the V fabric vision, if you will, is I covered a little bit on this de deployment policy notion, but it's how do, I, how do I wire together all these virtual machines and physical machines for that matter, it's external dependencies, because these days not, not everything may be virtualized, right? So you need to make sure you, you can span physical and virtual worlds, like your database, database might still be on physical. Um, and create a policy that you can use to spin up a platform that can power that application, and it knows where its dependencies are, right? So um, I'm deploying this, this in 
development. So in development time, it's going to hit the dev database. Or in staging, there's a certain database that it'll hit. It's not the production database, right, but it's sort of near production. So as you pick the app up and move it through the life cycle, having things specified at a higher level where you can map out those dependencies and the services you may need in that is, is fundamental to, you know, this policy-based automation notion. Uh, and again, we have some of that working in our demo pod, so you can kind of check out directionally what we're doing there. We're doing it in a generic way. So we're doing it so it'll provision out all the assets in our platform, but we're doing it so that you can uh, provision out if you have other app servers that you want to use as opposed to ours or other messaging systems or other caching or what have you. You should be able to use this as a gen general tool for provisioning and automating that process. Um, and then the transparent visibility uh, is key for sort of spinning up. I'll walk through a scenario there. The other area, and I'm sort of looking in, in the audience here, because one of the guys who's actively working with our vSphere counterparts is we're also looking at ways where we really feel that the lightweight nature of our runtime services allows you to get more out of your physical infrastructure, so it makes better use of memory and CPU and those types of things. But we're, we're investing a chunk of time with our vSphere counterparts when further optimizing that, right? When enabling Java workloads to actually be better neighbors, if you will, in how they consume memory, right? So that way you get more of an elastic experience, if you will, on how memory is actually consumed and or reserved, right, for use. Um, so that's key. Yes. So does this require a lightweight operating system or not? So your traditional deployment pattern for a lot of this stuff is you have the operating system in your guest. So you have your typical you know, Windows or Linux. It's typically most of our workloads use Linux, uh, as well as maybe a juice version of Linux that's trimmed down. Um, directionally, the kind of things that we want to do there is, you know, how do you just get the JVM running on the hypervisor? Right? That's an example. Right? Um, so that's the kind of optimization work that the engineers are, 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 are working towards. But there are actually things we can do, even with the OS still there, that can drive benefit of, I, you know, I have a ton of memory in these new servers, right? And Java workloads do not make optimal use of that memory, right? So there are things we can do to make sure that you actually get more out of the memory that is powering these virtual servers, right? Um, so there's definitely low-hanging fruit there to be had. That whole nirvana of... Java on the hypervisor, really cool directionally, but there's operational stuff and there's IT ops teams who are used to deploying things in a certain way, so there's entrenched behavior. It'll take a little while for people to sort of get comfortable with that, right? Um, so we're working sort of parallel tracks on hitting a bunch of things and then introducing them to our customers, so we basically groom the market for, for it, if you will. Hopefully that answered your, your question. Um, so. Uh, and then we, we mentioned the, uh, the data management stuff. It's cool to have highly mobile applications, but data latency is a big pain. And, you know, I've met with, you know, a ton of sort of enterprise customers, and they're going, you know, this cloud stuff sounds really cool, but until you solve the data problem, now nah, I'm not going there, right? Um, and that was why we made the investment in the Gemstone acquisition and the Rabbit acquisition is because you need technologies that can help you begin to address that sort of, that issue of, you know, you have data in your databases, your apps are high, highly mobile, and the further they move away, the slower the access is to that data, and that just falls apart, right? You don't get high-performing apps that way. Um, so um, the Gemfire uh, technology is really about next-generation data store. You can think of it as an in-memory distributed database that's persistent and transactional. Right? So it's globally distributed. And I'll get into an example that kind of illustrates it. It's sort of outside the norm um, to kind of, it's a pretty cool use case. Um, and then the rabbit is about, um, you know, enabling applications and services and other things that communicate um, together. So let's, let's um, use uh, one example to kind of give you an idea of this data fabric. And this is more of a DOD example, but I, I think it's kind of cool because the user interface on this thing is, is really kind of interesting. Um, so um, the, the military, the, you know, it's the global command and control uh, system, if you will. Um, 
they track where all the assets in globally are deployed, friend, foe, um, don't know, <laughs> right? And this is tanks, missiles, missiles in flight, right? Um, troops, everything, real time, where are they right now? And where are they right now? And where are they right now, right? Because they're moving. Um, and the same technology is actually used for tracking space junk as well. Like, where's all the space junk? So it's a, the data is moving around, the data is changing very dynamically. So in this case, where are the military assets? And then there's this Google 3D Earth viewport on that, that um, the joint task forces higher up in the you know, command chain will log in, and they, they can collaborate with the, the feet on the street, if you will, in you know, Afghanistan or what have you. And when they're looking at their area of where our friend, foe, and where are all our assets, they're looking at the same data real time, and, you know, um, and you know, it's truly mission critical information that's required. Um, previously, the data in a previous solution before this was a week out of date um, for the people in the field. Um, and now it's real time. They log in over low speed connections, right? As well, you know, it might be a desktop thing and then in the field, they have intermittent low speed connections, but they're able to you know, stream down their snapshots. So at worst case, they might be, you know, an hour out of date, you know, if, they, if they're not connected at that time. But if they're connected, they're looking at the real-time data. And uh, there are uh, 70 real-time feeds powering that solution, meaning the data for where all this positioning stuff resides across 70 different data stores, traditional mainframe data stores, um, relational data stores, or what have you. So that, that global scale of data access is what we mean by this new generation of applications. You need to factor in the technology can sort of address that. Um, so, and this, this, this is actually, uh, will shed a little light on things. So when I say we have visibility um, into the application, so Steve asked for his hotel booking app, right, earlier, right? Um, and uh, he wants to make sure that when he deploys that, that's gonna perform well and it's not gonna fall over when a ton of users start hitting the website. Um, so uh, being able to have visibility into exactly what's going on behind the scenes in that application is key, and that Hyperic technology I talked about as well as the Spring Insight, which is sort of automatic visibility into that framework layer, power that visibility so you can see how many hotel rooms per second are being booked. Um, so that way you can answer questions are, you know, is it within expected SOAs? Is the database a bottleneck? Because you can kind of drill down and see, is data access an issue? If, if it is, then you might provide a caching layer to speed it up, for instance. Um, and can I automatically add resource exactly where the application needs? Um, so that all sort of magically comes together, and you get the sort of communication between these layers, if you will. And I didn't create this. I'm not that great at PowerPoint, so, <laughs> right? But it is kind of mesmerizing, where you can basically power the application and begin to get a strong handshake. So when we actually look at a performance graph on this, you deploy your hotel room promotion, if you will, the traffic increases. You have a certain set of workload there. Ideally, you want to add resource just in time. You don't want to have to provision, over provision just in case. You want to add resource just in time. So based off of the traffic as it's going, you can scale up to meet the needs, because you can see how many hotel rooms is performing, what's the memory utilization, is it, you know, should I add more resource, and if so, let me add it that way. And, and then as it dips down, let me reclaim those resource so I can use it elsewhere, right? So that, when we say the handshake between the app tier and the infrastructure tier, this is an example of what we mean by that. Um, so, so I'm gonna be opening it up for a question shortly. But um, so when we look, uh, you know, there was sort of this term of virtualization journey that's been uh, talked about. When we look at the journey, particularly in the application infrastructure and uh, private cloud architectures and, you know, integrating with public cloud uh, infrastructures, et cetera, the journey that we see is it, your sort of table stakes, if you will, are you want to get virtualization, and you want to get a framework that enables that application to be portable, if you will. Um, 
And then you want to virtualize your application. So that memory utilization stuff, while it's going to be really cool for our technology, really at the end of the day we want you know, all Java workloads to perform as well as possible in the infrastructure, right? So, you know, uh, we, we need to win on providing our value above that, right? But ultimately, in order to get 100% virtualized, we want to, you know, raise, you know, the uh, stakes for all workloads. So you put WebSphere or WebLogic on there, you're going to get server consolidation benefits of doing that, right? So you should be able to do that as sort of your state, step one. Um, then really the... The two, three, and four are really about getting a lightweight alternative so you can actually get more, you know, better memory utilization, a higher density of app servers running within a virtual machine. So one of the examples of a customer, I believe, uh, they're, they're going to be doing a presentation in three or four weeks. We have a webinar coming up. And um, it's uh, the largest Pizza Hut franchiser. <laughs> um, for some reason, the pizza guys love our technology. I don't know why. Um, Lord knows I order enough pies um, <laughs> through the web, right? But it's powering their website, um, you know, and, and, you know, across their franchise. Um, and they were previously on um, Sun boxes using sort of the partitioning schemes that, you know, the Solaris zones and that kind of stuff. Um, and then what they, what they did was they looked at basically two HP commodity servers, right? Fairly well decked out in memory and that kind of stuff. Um, and then moved off of, they were previously using the JBoss, JTwe app server, but they were having memory issues and scalability issues. When they moved over, they used the lighter weight app server. And basically they're powering their website across four virtual machines, two on each physical host so they get the failover, right? So if anyone goes down. And then three, uh, three to four instances of our app server running in each side of those virtual machines. So you get 16, right, four times four, 16 app servers fielding load, and their CPU utilization, and they're over-dialing it. They're only dialing it, you know, out to one vCPU per VM with four instances of the app server running in that VM, right? So they're really getting high compression ratio, and their CPU utilization is almost nil, um, and the memory utilization is much better. Um, so it was an interesting architectural choice once they got to stage two uh, of that. So they were, a, they were able to get a smaller number of VMs you know, um, from the physical infrastructure, but many more app servers fielding the load, so they're fine with scaling out. And so they'll add another VM with another four app servers or one on each box, and he basically they have a lot of headroom, as an example. Um, and then the cloud data management, we covered that in the Gemfire area. Other use cases that we're seeing that in our travel industry, online gaming is actually using this technology, and there's some really use, cool use cases for how that technology is powering like customized on-demand ads that are targeted to people you know, on online gaming sites. So you get highly targeted, geographically appropriate you know, advertising. Right? Now, I'm never on these sites, I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, and then the cloud platform is really about this policy-based automated experience. The reality is most folks are in the uh, stage one to stage two in the conversations that I, I talk about. This isn't linear, so some customers are basically, we're still physical in our, you know, our application server infrastructure, but we want to address the data tier first, and they might do the data tier first, right? So this isn't sort of you know, linear progression. But when we talk with our customers, this is kind of a roadmap that we see as they begin to embrace these new technologies, if you will. Um, so, uh, again, this session was really more about sort of application infrastructure in this virtual world and what it means. Hopefully I mapped it to the IT as a service vision. Um, what the key drivers are that are driving how we're making our investments there and how we're optimizing it with the virtual platform to sort of give you an idea of dovetailing what VMware vFabric is. So there was... Uh, a good question earlier. Are there any other sort of questions on some of the stuff that I've covered? Um, thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, question was around the Department of Defense example. 
So what, the, um, in that, and how, is it really request, reply, is it push, is it more of a message-based system to get the data where it needs to be? Um, no, this notion of a data fabric is you set up, they've configured data pumps, if you will, of those 70 stores into an in-memory database, right? And that's what the data fabric is. And then it's partitioned so that way, you know, geographically distributed data is sort of moved to where it needs to be so it's higher speed. But if you want to get access to it from somewhere else, it can be replicated over if need be, but it's, it's placed to where it's ne typically needed the most, more qu most quickly. Um, so it's not really a pub sub or messaging based infrastructure. It's, it's really a database in the sky, if you will, right? And um, some people use the term operation, next generation operational data store as an you know, as how they look at this area. And so Wall Street, some of the people are using this technology on Wall Street, that's exactly how they think of it for their risk based app. Uh, applications is they just have data flowing through the fabric. It may rest in databases, um, but all their apps are built on top of the real-time data. Like, they treat that as the single source of truth, right? And that's, you know, and then they have pumps that pump it in and transact it back, basically. Question? So with that technology, can you Right, so the question was, is do you have the ability to replicate that data uh, offline or into a client? So there, um, the technology is a distributed server technology, but it also has smart clients. So one of the examples, again, on Wall Street that's used is um, traders tr um, basically have uh, cached, edge-cached versions that they access through their Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, so that technology, as well as the Rabbit technology, works for Java, works for .NET, works for C, right? The Rabbit technology works for Ruby. If you go out on, uh, uh, you know, uh, Engine Yard, for instance, you know, the Ruby communities are using this messaging to do messaging between their Ruby applications. So when we look at that fa the vFabric, while TC Server and Spring are Java-oriented, um, you know, the other elements, Hyperic, Gemfire, Rabbit, all these other areas are cross uh, language cross-platform, um, so they're leverageable um, in uh, you know .NET shops, as an example. So did that answer your question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, it depends. So I, you know I. I Give an example, uh, let's see, Orbitz is somebody who's using our Tomcat and our Spring and that kind of stuff. And over the years, they've built up a, a ton of different uh, scripts, configuration scripts and automa automation scripts. There's other folks like um, financial services customers where they've gone through and inventoried exactly configuration scripts for the web spheres or web logics they have, and they have hundreds of thousands of lines of code of just config scripts. Right, so they've invested a lot of time in custom-built, you know, cruft, if you will, and, and enable them to kind of get close to that. But the realities are, you know, virtualization really is, you know, you, you can only get so far on physical infrastructure. You can't provision new hardware, <laughs> right? But the virtual data center notions that you that we talked about earlier, you now have true resource pools where you can actually dynamically provision up servers, network, storage, wire it together and V-shield it so it's secure, right? And that's really, that's the end game in a lot of this. Yeah. Exactly. People aren't doing that today, right? Um, the reality is this is a, uh, this is a journey, right? Um, now, how we are bringing it together is the Hyperic technology has the ability to do SLA management, right? Then when it tips it over, you kick off a control action, right? And that control action effectively calls into the vCloud API 
to do the magic, right? Um, so that's one thing. Then the Napa stuff is about if you want to kick off something, you're going to need to provision the runtime and put the application on there so it's configured properly. And that's the additional handshake that happens, right? So we're basically providing that glue and then also the tools to do it and the hook points, right? But making it open, because the Hyperic platform, after all, is sort of open, so you're able to you know, not only call our API or our script, but then inject your own stuff so you can do things before or after or what have you, right? I mean, that's, so we, we want to give you an out-of-box experience, but you, you need hooks before and after to do your, you know, magic, if you will, right? Um, and again, it's, there is sort of, sort of a vision of where we're heading and, and, and where the reality are, and we're really, get, you know, honing in on, uh, like I said, what I'm covering here is stuff we have today or is, is rolling out over the next, like, six months. So it's getting closer, but, you know, again, we're grooming the market. This is, there's a lot of entrenched behavior, right? So they're not going to go, oh, you know, let me just go on autopilot and, you know, leverage this stuff. It's, you know, you need, you need to get familiar with it, right? So any other? Yes. Um, could you repeat your question? Right, so the, uh, are the integration features of that Spring layer, are they available only for vFabric or are they available for others? So Spring is a portable programming model. People are creating Spring integration-based applications that are running on WebSphere today, on WebLogic today, right? So it's not something that's tied to vFabric or you require vFabric. vFabric will just give you optimal runtime services. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, so the integration patterns are designed to integrate with stuff that's not our platform powering it, right? Yep, exactly. And then um, also, furthermore, the VM force, Salesforce notion, one of the use cases we have with our customers is they want to be able to write applications that need to be close to the force.com database, and then they want to integrate it with their internal database. And so the integration patterns need to span both of those in a secure you know, uh, way as well. Um, and in that case, we have our technology on both sides as an example, but you don't, you know, you don't really need uh, the vFabric services. Uh, it's just t typical integration pattern. Yeah. So um, uh, Rabbit enables applications written in a wide range of applications to interact with RabbitMQ. Put messages on the bus, pull them off the bus. Yep. So it's uh, cr cross-platform, multi-platform. Not just on our vFabric. Yep. Any other questions? Yes. In the Right, so um, can we pull some of these components out? So let me go back to the, uh, the slide. It's probably easier. So that top layer is decoupled from the vFabric services, right? So if you're doing integration-based applications, Ideally, we'd like you to deploy them on our platform, but you don't have to. You just get a better experience. You get the spring visibility, and you get a lot of this automagic stuff happening. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, it can run on a, different, on a different platform, and that's the portability layer. And spring's been delivering that for five years. When I ran product strategy at JBoss, um, I saw the rise of spring, and over 50% of the applications that are deployed on JBoss are spring apps. Same with WebSphere, same with WebLogic. So there's springs very, very widely deployed. Um, and uh, so the, you know, the integration patterns, et cetera. From a messaging standpoint, Spring abstracts it out. There's uh, WebSphere shops are using Spring to abstract out messages pushed onto MQ, you know, WebSphere MQ, right? Um, that's not our messaging system, but it abstracts it out and gives you a consistent programming model and enables you to use MQ if you want to. Um, that's, the, that's the point of the of that programming layer. Uh, 
Um, the question was, is when is the uh, memory optimization stuff coming out? So you and Ben there can talk uh, later. We'll take that one offline. That's a work in progress. Um, there's some stuff that we're doing on the existing vSphere 4 one today, and there's other things happening in the upcoming uh, vSphere release that's uh, effectively next summer as well. Right? So it's an ongoing effort. Yes? Right. So um, can I summarize when a developer would use Spring versus uh, the Google platform? Um, so, um, so, and let me sort of get a definition of terms on the Google side of things, right? So Google App Engine is effectively a platform for running Python-based applications and Java-based applications, right? So it's, it's their platform as a service, if you will. So the vFabric services are not used in that sense because Google App Engine provides the data stores and, and that kind of stuff for the platform. And it's what, we've, what we're doing is making it easy to create and deploy Spring Java applications onto Google App Engine, right? So you get that layer of portability. So you can deploy it to our platform, but you can put it on Google App Engine. And the reason there's engineering effort required there is Google App Engine isn't quite a full Java platform. It has some guide rails. <laughs> that developers have to follow. So we're abstracting those guide rails in, in our spring layer so developers don't have to think about it as much. They just do it the spring way, they deploy it, and then spring will take care of some of the funky stuff under the hood that Google App Engine requires. And there's already a ton of code in spring today that's WebSphere, WebLogic specific, and JBoss specific. So we're adding Google App Engine specific code and VM4 specific code around the force.com data store as an example. So that's answer number one. The other one is, is there's, Google has the GWT, Google Web Toolkit framework, right? Um, and that's, that provides, a, you know, sort of, if you look at any of the Google applications, they're all powered, the web apps are powered by GWT. And GWT actually makes it really easy to target, you know, the iPhone and Android device, right? So rather than write our own stuff in the Spring framework, what we've done is we've tightly integrated Spring with GWT, so that way you get rich apps running on your iPhone, iPad, and uh, Android devices, and we don't have to do that because GWT is, is increasing in popularity. And what we do from a Java developer standpoint is make the experience productive and familiar, right? So that way they don't have to learn learn, you know, how do I create an application with GWT and here's like 50 different integration points? No. We have a, you know, app generator tool that, blam, just generates it out and you've got an app up and running that's GWT enabled in 10 minutes, right? So that's, that's how we're investing. Question. Right, so the question was, is, um, you know, as we le add levels of richness to our platform um, that aren't available necessarily on a Google App Engine platform or on a VM force, how do you gracefully degrade, right? Um, and that's why this Spring Tool Suite piece of the equation is important um, because we have code generators and there's a Spring Roo technology which does code generation. Um, so we're able to begin to generate things out you know, in a very predictable way that basically enabled developers to kind of do it the right way first, you know. And, and, and in, all, in the cases where you're doing something that's not portable, what we want to do is kind of give you the squiggly line type of thing and going, you know, you know you're really going to be, you know, not portable in this. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to be using Google Maps API for something, you're tied to the Google Maps API, right? You know, I, there's only so much abstracting we can do, right? But from the actual platform services and data stores, like Google App Engine has its own way of storing data that's not relational. From a developer standpoint, they shouldn't care. They just like, here's my Java object, put it here, right? And it should be familiar and consistent. And that's how, that's how we're doing the abstraction, okay? So uh, we've reached the top of the hour, so I appreciate really good questions. 
I will be outside so the next room can come in here, but uh, if you have any further questions for me. Um, and if you want to hear the optimization stuff, Ben Corey, the guy right there, um, can you know, wax poetic about all the optimizations we're doing of Java on, on the uh, hypervisor. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs>